a community that is marginalized. We come and we see that Muslims all across this country today have to combat the lights of Islamophobia, have to combat rhetoric, have to combat language on a day-to-day -day basis where we're fearful many times to leave our homes, to take public transportation. Day after day we hear of an uptick in the number of hate crimes directed toward the Muslim community. Many times we can become fearful, but we learn from this particular verse that in moments of adversity, those who channel themselves, their hearts, their souls, their existences toward the presence of God and realizing that He is the help and He is the support, at that moment of struggle, they have potential for God to allow His divine light and blessing to bestow upon our hearts and our souls and rather our faith increases as opposed to turning away. When we come, we try to understand how to build out our identity and our communities in light of the diversity that we have amongst Muslim Americans today. We see that people are of all different theological backgrounds. People are of all different observances. People speak different languages and we come from different cultures. And oftentimes we see that within our community, especially on a college campus, it's a lot easier for me to go and speak to someone who's not within the folds of my faith in comparison with speaking to someone of a different theology and a different identity. We come and we see, for instance, that so many times within our communities, we're very quick to jump on this notion of building out relationships in multi-faith communities. I can go and I can speak to a Christian priest or a Jewish rabbi on a day-to-day -day basis. Individuals who may not believe uh, in the same God as I believe in or the same prophet that I believe in. But nonetheless, we can be friends and we can have relationships with one another without any sort of debate or without any sort of controversy. And seemingly whenever there's a conversation about how one can engage with individuals who are Muslims from different folds and from different theologies, it becomes an issue that is very sensitive, very controversial, very worrisome, and very taboo. We have to come forth and understand on one level that there are certain symptoms that give rise toward this particular theory or belief system within our communities. For instance, today, we have individuals who are very quick to jump and label one another. We have individuals, for instance, who love to use the word kafir in order to explain their Muslim theological counterpart, so to say. We come and we see within famous narration narrated by all Muslims, Shia and Sunni theologians, narrated from Osama and Zayd, in which he, stand, in which he stated that one day the Prophet sent out an expedition toward the outskirts of the city of Medina because he had received news that there were a group of individuals who were causing a little bit of chaos, specifically being harmful toward Muslim women and children. The narration comes forth and continues to state that these Muslims who went out to go and see what was happening on the outskirts of the holy city of Medina, they saw this oppression taking place, so they took out their swords and they began to combat, they began to fight those seemingly troublemakers. A couple of moments later, the Prophet is asking Osama bin Zayd, is asking the companions, he said, what happened? He said, we began to fight until many of them from the opposing side, they lost their weapons, and as we were about to strike them, they began to call out, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That there is no God but Allah and, and the Prophet of God, Muhammad is his messenger. And the Prophet says, and then what did you do? He says, at that moment we killed them. He says, why would you kill them? They stated, O oh, Prophet of God, we didn't kill them because what they were saying in terms of reciting the Shahada, reciting the testimony, they were only stating such a thing because they were fearful of our swords. They didn't actually believe within their hearts. And the Prophet comes forth to respond toward them, telling them, do you were you able to see what was in their hearts? Today, when we come and take a look at college campuses all across the country, 
at mosques all across the world, were always quick to jump and determine who was a Muslim and who was not a Muslim. On this idea that we think that we are more knowledgeable about matters of faith than everyone else. We come forth and we see furthermore that this idea and this theology and this belief system that is filtered into so many of our communities has given rise for many of us to become reactionary. We go on social media, we turn on satellite TV, we go on YouTube, we watch a video of a particular speaker, a particular scholar who says X and Y and Z, and we're very quick to jump and label every single person who might be listening to that individual or might be following that person on Twitter and stating that everyone is a disbeliever because they follow what that guy said without taking into account the context of that language without taking into account the language of those semantics and so on and so forth. We're very judgmental people, unfortunately. But we need to make sure and realize that at the same time, what we're doing is we're feeding into a lot of the same extremism that we, for instance, in the Shia community, for years and for centuries and for decades, have been victims of. That in my life, I have been called not only a terrorist, and not only been called bin Laden, and not only been told to go back to my home because people seemingly have determined me to be a Muslim being here in America, but I've been called the son of Muta, I've been called an individual who's a staff of it. I've been told that I'm a grave worshiper. So on both sides, we have all of this language and rhetoric marginalizing us as followers of Ahlul Bayt, salam, but at the same time, that should give some sort of an empowerment toward us to not only gather together in these sorts of large gatherings and organize events in the name of combating this rhetoric, but making sure that we're making valuable steps within our lives and progression in order to be more impactful in gatherings like this. In other words, we come and we see that today we have a lot of opportunities within our lives. That over here, we're on a campus of I don't know how many thousands of people. How many of us within Ahlul Bayt Student Association, for instance, has a relationship with the other Muslim student groups on campus? When someone is able to humanize one another from a different group, from a different theology, from a different culture, we see all of a sudden that we won't dislike or we won't uh, separate ourselves or segregate ourselves from that other group of people. Let me give you an example. I myself, like an open, unfortunately, supporter of like the New York Knicks. I'm a big Knicks fan. I watch basketball a lot, and I watch the Knicks, and every day they go off for them to continue to lose, especially over the last month of the year, that they kept on winning, which is really hurting, hurting their you know, lottery opportunities uh, to get first round pick. And the minute that I'm able to introduce myself as a Knicks fan, it doesn't matter who I'm speaking to, all of a sudden, if they watch basketball, or if they know anything about basketball, or if they know anything about Knicks, we're going to start a conversation about basketball that's probably not going to end anytime soon, right? The minute that I mention Knicks, everyone like starts smiling or laughing or whatever. Maybe they're laughing at me because I'm really such a terrible team, right? But you see that all of a sudden that I'm a human being who watches basketball, and it doesn't matter that I'm a follower of Ahlul Bayt, it doesn't matter that I'm a Muslim anymore, at that moment, the only thing that you see is that I'm a Knicks fan. Similarly, what we need to do in order to combat sectarianism, in order to combat this phrase that I would like to use, radical Islam, this first step that we need to make is to humanize ourselves. But not because that we need to humanize ourselves because we're not human, but rather we need to make sure that we're feeding in toward being good representatives of the faith that we believe in. And the way that we can do that is breaking down the boundaries and barriers without speaking on matters of faith and without speaking on matters of theology. I don't have to go toward my friends, toward my neighbors, toward my colleagues, and begin to tell them, look, the religion of Islam is not the religion that you see on TV, it's not the religion that you see on Fox News, it's not the religion that you're seeing on Donald Trump's Twitter feed. No, you don't have to go ahead and say that. You have to introduce yourself as an individual, as a man, as a woman, as a student, as a professional who likes to drink coffee, you know, and invite your neighbor to a cup of coffee, and that's the way that you can break down all sorts of barriers because you begin to get to know people. We, at our disposal, have so many resources. 
thousands of people on this campus that we can build up relationships with, right? That are going to present toward them that your faith and my faith and your identity is actually something that is a lot more compatible with their identity in ways that they could have never imagined if you never took time out of yourself, out of ourselves, to go and spend time with them. This is number one. Number two, in understanding that we, followers of Ahmed Bayt, those who call themselves Shia, are victims of a great deal of oppression all across the world today. Be it the thousands who were killed in Nigeria eight months ago, be it the bombing that we hear on a monthly basis in Balochistan or in Kuwaita, be it in certain pockets in the Middle East, in South Asia, in parts of this country, in countries, you know, in the West, nonetheless that also gives us a unique responsibility to make sure that we are the spokespeople for oppressed people all across the world. Because my religion, my faith, and my prophet, and my imams, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, and the imams that come from his progeny, they all were the spokespeople against injustice wherever they saw it. When we see ourselves as victims of oppression, that requires us to make a stand against, against oppression and injustice across the board. That means speaking out for African American rights, for our African American brothers who are getting gunned down in the streets all across this country. That means going to Standing Rock and speaking out against this pipeline that is being drilled underneath their blessed land. That means calling out injustice wherever we see it because we should have the best notion and perception of what exactly it means to be an oppressed minority. Imam Latif is a sought-after speaker, having been invited to share his insights and experiences to diverse audiences all around the world. He has been featured in numerous media outlets including The Huffington Post, BBC, NPR, CNN, The New York Times, New York Magazine, The Colbert Report, Katie Couric, Newsweek, Time, BET, and GOTV. And with that, I would like to invite Imam Khalid Latif to the stage. Thank you. upon his most beloved sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and upon all those who choose to tread in his path until the last day. It is said that there was a young man who had a deep love for his family. That he had a wife that he had a great care and affection for and they had a young son who was the object of their adoration. This young man finds himself in the situation that his mother passes away and his elderly father needs a place to go and stay, so he goes and stays in the home of his son, the young man. And the elderly father, he needs constant care and attention. It causes a lot of commotion and frustration in their home. They don't want to look after him. Then one night they sit down to eat their dinner and this elderly man, he is so frail, he is so fragile that the sheer weight of the plate that he's holding in his hands is too much for him to handle. It falls from his grasp onto the ground, shattering into pieces. The young man, he can't contain the frustration anymore. He turns to his father enraged and says, no longer will you be able to eat at the same table as my wife, my son, and I. But since you can't eat without causing a commotion, henceforth you will sit at a table in the side of the room by yourself. And since you can't eat off of the same plates that we eat off of without making a mess, from now on you will eat from this wooden bowl. And the elderly man with a tear in his eyes, he goes and does what he is told. The next day now, this young man, he comes upon his own son, he comes upon his own child, and he sees him on the ground playing with some scraps of wood. 
And he wants to be with his son. He wants to play and participate in what his child is doing. And when he gets close enough to him, he says with a deep love and adoration in his voice, Yeah, Ibni, oh my son, what are you doing? And the young boy, reciprocating the same adoration and affection, says to his father, Oh my father, Ya yeah, Abi, I'm making a wooden bowl for you to eat out of when you get older. We learn implicitly and explicitly. Consciously and unconsciously. The I that is me today is most assuredly impacted by every yesterday that I lived in this world. And the moment that I find myself in right now will inform moments that will come on every tomorrow that I am blessed to see. The interactions and experiences that I've had thus far, the relationships, the presence of individuals, as well as the absence, yields the I that is me as much as it makes you the you that is you. And to be able to understand the conversation that we're having tonight necessitates thinking and reflecting upon the words that our Sheikh has shared with us to really think about why it is that people see us in certain ways. Starts from understanding why it is that we see people in certain ways. Because what you see of those around you is not always indicative of who they are. But it's indicative of who in fact you are. It tells you a lot about yourself. And where you find yourself perpetuated by myopic perspectives, whether it is Muslims that have no idea what Islam is really about, Harnessing something that's meant to be a spiritual vehicle that uplifts celestial parts of yourself and draws you to places of contentment regardless of where you stand. Whether you are in celebration or tragedy, whether you find yourself in hardship and turmoil or in moments of ecstasy, you have a certain mindfulness and confidence utilizing Islam as a mechanism for real contentment because it's tied to a treasure that exists within you that's your heart. They turn it into a weapon that's not about bringing people up but pushing people down. Or if you find yourself in places where you can find to realities and boxes that society seeks to put you in that tells you that you are not bigger than anything that they believe you to stereotypically be. When in reality, most definitely, you are bigger than most boxes that anybody tries to put you in. You have a lot more to you than what it is that they stereotype you to. But to think about where that mindset comes from and to be able to understand and assess it within the framework of the conversation that we're having tonight necessitates looking deeply within yourself. Because the only thing that you bring to any of these experiences is the presence of you. And if you don't know what's going on in you, your sole purpose is to think about why the other is the way that they are. It's just going to perpetuate what it is that we see and what it is that we find. On the way down here, I was talking to Sheikh Fayaz. We were driving down together to think about what it is that I would say. And I recognized and realized as soon as I saw his face when I walked into our Islamic Center's lounge that he was wearing a nice suit and a vest and I was wearing jeans and boots that this was not a good start to a night. I apologize to you. And I don't mean disrespect from my attire. Just got caught up in a few things, but I hope you forgive me. And it doesn't take away from the importance of the discussion. To understand what it was that he was saying requires us to think about what this deen is really about. The ritualistic and legalistic frameworks that at times becomes what is overtly emphasized. And I'm not saying that that's something that we should step away from, but complementing it with real understanding of what love means, what compassion means, what hope means, what justice means, what truth means, what integrity means, what good character means. Most people turn away from religion because of religious people. We get to a place where our relationship with the divine becomes something that is so confined to realities that we don't know how to fit in, and we are constantly in a place where we are on the defensive that says, then who are you to tell me what it is that I am when you have never even really walked in my shoes? 
For many of us, our perspective of the other, even if the other is a Muslim, comes not from actual engagement with that other, at least through the framework of that characteristic that makes us different from one another. But it comes from just engagement of narratives that fills gaps, that can capitalize off of us being separate from one another. Look at the society that we live in today. The one that undeniably is motivated by elements of race, ethnicity, and class that teach us to not only be away from those that are different from us, but to have the worst perspectives and perceptions I can't control governmental apparatus. I can't control geopolitical realities. I can't control the way that those things inform the way how doctrine develops and how it disseminates to populations. But for us to start to really pull away from what it is that imposes these perspectives, we have to start to think why it's so easy for some of us to adopt understandings of those that are different from us in the worst ways possible. So what Sheikh Fayal said makes more sense than anything. But how we actualize it and implement it becomes a subjective decision. Because you can sit here and you can hear the hadith. Osama ibn Zayd, he says to the Prophet wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, inna ma kana muta'awwadha that he was just seeking protection. He says, did you kill him after he said, La ilaha illallah? Ya Rasulullah, he was just scared to die. Did you open up his chest and look into his heart to see if this was the reason? Ya Osama, kayfa tasma'una bil la ilaha illallah fa idha jad bil yawm al qiyamah then, oh Osama, what are you going to do when he comes carrying that la ilaha illallah against you on the day of judgment? The narrative is not meant to be something that is just about charisma and inspiration, but to be reflective and contemplative to say that what will it motivate me to do? That will I yield a certain courage that says that I will go and be with somebody rather than waiting for them to come and be with me? Will I be able to engage individuals and personalities, entire populations and demographics by actually understanding who it is that they are by sitting with them? Or will I just continue to sit with the narratives that have been imposed upon me? And as a broader notion, this can be applied to pretty much anybody that we can think of. I'm saying this to you as somebody who finds myself as being one like myself in many gatherings where there are not people who are like me. And it's hard. But so much of our identity is informed by the people that are around us. I know that I am who I am because there are people that engage a familiarity and communally inform my identity. When you go through that process of being able to leave behind the fact what it is that you uniquely can by building the relationships that others pass up on because all that they're looking at this world through is that vision that is tainted by those stereotypes and those preconceived ideas and notions. And then they miss out on immense opportunity. And you know that it's something that Muslims do. Whether they are Sunni or Shia, you know that you have these realities that just manifest themselves in different aspects of segmentation. So we can sit down and I can pull all of you and I know that some of you either go through yourself or have friends who know that they will never be able to marry somebody from a different culture than their own. That their parents would not even tolerate the fact that it would be okay for them to bring somebody whose skin color was different than theirs into their homes that the ability to be able to navigate some of these things that we hold on to that are pushing us apart are not things that are sectarian in nature, but they become the fundamental block and obstacle that we have to overcome because that opportunity that is yielded, not by us being away from each other, but by those who gain from us being separate will continue to be a means through which they benefit at our detriment. What Malcolm Rahimahullah tells his people 
is that if you recognize how strong you actually are, you would not find yourself in this reality. If you understood the strength of just your sheer numbers, and you recognize that those who impose upon you the perspectives that are rooted in making you feel embarrassed by your blackness, embarrassed by your identity, and get you to a place that says you have to fully assimilate in order to be accepted, to feign gratitude when they give to you that which you're entitled to in the first place, the message still has to resonate. Because when that world out there says Muslim, but they say it in a derogatory way, they're not saying Shia Muslim or Sunni Muslim. They're not saying brown Muslim or black Muslim or white Muslim. Half the time they don't even mean Muslim. They're looking at Sikhs and Hindus and Latino Protestants and Buddhists and they're attacking them as well. But when we are separate, they are able to gain. And their ability to gain is rooted in us, not seeing us through who we actually are, but through the prism of those gaps that came into our socialization. In a university setting, you have unique opportunity. The masjid is the masjid, and we need to have masjids that cater to direct populations. My great, great, great grandfather, if he was Muslim, probably didn't speak English. He needs to be able to go into a religious space that speaks to his reality, that understands what it is that he has seen. It would be just as problematic for him to have to be made to endure a space that I feel comfortable in, as much as it would be for me to have to be in a space that he finds a sense of solace. Sometimes in a diverse community, you have to have spaces that are either or. But when you're in a university setting and you're in an institution that celebrates diversity and dialogue, at least on a theoretical level, you can now learn about yourself by going and being with those that are different from you. And the notions they'll come into your head, why should I do it? Why should I do it when people treat me in a certain way? Why should I do it when they only see me through a certain prison? Why should I do it when they only allow for me to be present if I let go of certain parts of myself? If you think only in the immediate, then the immediate is only what you will gain. Our Islamic Center at New York University has existed in a professional model for about 12 years now, give or take. This past January, a part-time associate chaplain who we hired when his Shia in background, Sheikh Fiaz Jafar, started working for us full time. Probably unique in terms of university institutions that cater to Muslim life on campuses, but also a unique dynamic in the sense that it's not just creating opportunity that's ceremonial to say that we are Sunni or we are Shia, but to be able to celebrate identity, it doesn't happen overnight. And it requires for some of us to be able to think years ago, how do we get to a place that we want to be down the line that lays the roots now so that we can grow in a way that allows for collective benefit by having multiple entry points that caters to diversity that exists within our systems of law and theology. It's hard to do that when you see only through pain. And it's not to invalidate pain. It's not to discount pain. It's not to say that we don't need to heal because there are gross realities and atrocities that take place throughout this world that you see immense persecution, inequity across the board. And Allah make things easy for all of us. But at some level, we have to make a firm commitment to say, how will we play a role to shift the narrative? that says what was is not what necessarily must be. And where we will take chances and we will display courage and we will find strength and empowerment through our faith. To be able to understand that that la ilaha illallah is a more powerful unifier than anything. But to recognize it, again, 
necessitates an affirming understanding of the you that you are bringing to that testimony of faith that you utter. You're going to always find reasons to find where somebody else is lacking and inadequate. You're going to always find reasons to be able to say, well, this is why somebody doesn't belong. And it becomes strange. It becomes unique. I, as a Sunni, should not be invited to a Shia student association to only be talking about Sunni-Shia relations. As much as my friend and spiritual brother, who is a sheikh, should not only be talking to our community about quote-unquote explicit Shia issues, or only talking to Shia students. And you have the unique ability in this place to be able to set that precedent for communities that are local here. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have your own space, but at times to be able to work beyond certain lines and boundaries and to start to really think in the long term, well, what is the collective benefit that we will gain by being able to increase in those ways? And what gives us an indication and understanding that we are able to have that type of uniformity, that type of unity. So you start to look deeply within. And you assess what it is that you have the opportunity to do. And then as young people at this university, you venture across to be able to gain and benefit in ways that now then enable you to start to see your religion and your deen as a mechanism for not just benefit in an insular capacity that's a Muslim bubble, but you go out and you just live your faith and you live your Islam and you live compassion and you live love and you live hope and you live justice and you live truth the way our predecessors did in a way that just gives back without condition and without qualification. Not to prove to somebody that you belong. Not to be in a place where you are constantly with your back against the wall saying that I too am somebody who has a place here. But even if nobody thinks you belong, you still do good because that's what we do. That even if nobody lets you believe that you have a place where it is that you are, you understand and recognize beyond a sense of entitlement that you are to embody what it was that our prophet was sent to embody. And those who have that myopic perspective, they turn labels that are meant to be a means of understanding and empowerment into words that turn into weapons and slurs, that you're gonna take back those words and you're gonna turn them into something that embodies the beauty that it's supposed to embody. That starts from in here and recognizing what it is that really moves you and what it is that it really pushes you towards. What is it that it compels you against? What is it that you are seeking and what is it that you are trying to find? And as you start to have those conversations and you start to have those discussions, you start to build and work towards those things that enable you to leave this place in such a way that those that will come after you are going to have it that much better. Our human condition is rooted in some of these ideas of discrimination. It believes Shaitan, when he was commanded by Allah to prostrate to Adam, said, no, I'm of fire, he is of dirt, I am better than he is, essentially. He was the first racist. And when he can get to a place where he's able to reinvent for us ideas that stem from this type of segmentation and racism, he's going to bring us to it. And if he can get it to us in a way where he's able to justify and validate in our minds, utilize his scripture that says, in pursuit of everything that is good, I am going to somehow now start to label people as outside of the fold of this faith. How is there not something that is more problematic than that? What my teachers taught me was that you should assume that a thousand people have belief and be wrong. 
rather than assume that one person does not have belief and be valid in that. That the default should be to assume the best of those that are around you. But just remember who your teachers are, man. And if there's idiots out there who don't know how to do anything other than elevate themselves about 45 minutes to get down here, and I grew up here in Edison, New Jersey, and I was here a week ago at Rutgers. Now I'm here at Rutgers again, a week later. I said to people there, and I'll say it to you now, I probably wouldn't be Muslim if it wasn't for Rutgers University. When I went to NYU as an undergrad, there wasn't really anything going on. And what I found here during my undergrad years, even though I went to another school, was a sense of real brotherhood and sisterhood amongst people from very diverse backgrounds. And so speaking in a personal capacity, I will tell you that it would be an honor and a privilege to help you in whatever ways that I can. And I know speaking on behalf of my brother, who's a much better person than I am, he would be 10 steps ahead of me already helping you in whatever ways he could. But where we might be able to be of assistance, please don't hesitate in reaching out. And if this is the only time that we're meant to be together, then I pray, inshallah ta'ala, Allah gathers us all together again in the best of places in the world beyond this one. Please keep us in your prayers. You and your community will be in ours. May Allah give to us all only the best in this world and the best in the next. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa billahi tawfiq. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you, Imam Khalid Latif, for your inspiring words. Hopefully, we can all benefit from these speakers tonight and have a strengthened identity, identity as Muslims and as minorities. Our jobs, first and foremost, emphasized by our Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt, are educating ourselves. Yes, do good and speak against oppression, but how much good can we truly do when we remain ignorant? The Muslim Ummah as a whole is facing intense scrutiny by all, so it is our obligation to be educated in our responses and intelligent in our actions. Before I let you all go, I'd like a huge round of applause for our speakers tonight. And a thank you to our co-sponsors for tonight. This event wouldn't be possible without our entire board, so I'd like to take a moment to say all their names. <coughs> our president, Molester, our vice presidents, Hiba and Fatma, our board administrator, Asad and Mushtaba, our events coordinator, Iraj, our public relations head, Sara, and our external affairs, Hiba. Mashallah, this year we've had the largest secondary board <coughs> ever. It consists of Ali, Ali Zaman, Amin, Amin, Arham, Fatma, Fizza, Irtiza, Jawad, Kashif, Pranti, Kulsum, Layla, Maha, Muhammad, Nadim, Nida, Rana, Samin, Samir, Sana, and Taki. We have worked long and hard to make this event possible. So can get so can I get an, <clears throat> another huge round of applause for our entire board? <clears throat> and with that I would like to conclude our program for tonight and dinner served outside. <clears throat>